It's review time, review time. So Neurips has recently released the reviews for submitted papers and pretty much everyone is not happy. And I think the reason is that even though you have the reasonable reviewers of these conferences, there is always, always reviewer number two. And reviewer number two <laughs> leaves a very short review, says that either there are not enough experiments, or the theory is too weak, or the assumptions aren't warranted, or they just don't like your face. And that's why they give you a weak reject. Actually, some of them think your paper is fantastic and give you a weak reject. So a lot of people are angry, upset, dissatisfied with the quality of the reviews in machine learning conferences. And today I want to go look in a bit into how this works, why this is the way that it is, and what we could potentially do about it. So what's happening with publishing in ML? The system seems to be overloaded. There's so much attention in machine learning right now that there hasn't been a few years ago, that there's a huge influx of new people wanting to publish in this field. That creates a lot of submissions and not enough reviewers to peer review these submissions. So a lot of reviewers are recruited that probably shouldn't be reviewers. I hear stories of undergrads being recruited as reviewers, people from way outside the fields, people that don't have time. So too many submissions, too few inexperienced and not really expert reviewers creates pretty much a random process. And this was also shown in a few years ago in the then NIPS experiment, where it showed that for most papers, being accepted is pretty much a coin flip with a weighted coin. The natural response as an author is going to be, you're going to submit even more papers. If it's a coin flip, you can just submit whatever and there's a chance it might get in, which of course only makes the problem worse. So this entire process of science where you submit your manuscript and then you get the reviews and then you try to improve it, it's completely broken because not only do you not care about the reviews, the next set of reviewers at the next conference are going to be different. So no matter what you improve right now, the next set of people will have completely different criticism. It just doesn't work like it is intended to work. The review process is basically just some kind of a random nuisance to people that they have to get through. And at the same time, people who are reviewers have every incentive to make it as hard as possible for the people that are submitting. So in order to analyze this, I want to look at the incentives of the different groups in this process and kind of show how the incentive structure upholds this system that benefits pretty much everyone participating in it, but creates a worse outcome for all of us. So first of all, let's look at paper authors. What are your incentives if you're an author of a paper? First of all, authors, they want to get as many papers as possible, as fast as possible. Now in the current conference system, the fastness isn't really up for debate. It's as fast as it is. However, authors can simply upload their paper to archive and be as fast as they want there. Another incentive for authors is to have as little comments on your paper as possible, because comments usually mean criticism and you don't want comments and especially you don't want public permanent comments. The good thing for authors right now is on archive comments aren't possible and conference reviews, even if they're made public, no one goes to look at them. Everyone just goes to archive. So authors right now are getting a pretty good deal with respect to not getting their work criticized. Authors are also incentivized to give as little credit to people as possible. And again, the current system is totally in favor of that. The no commenting on archive basically means that you can claim whatever you want. And if someone wants to refute you, they have to make a big deal out of it and basically write their own paper. And again, people will probably not find that. On the other hand, in the conferences, reviewers are supposed to detect when you're not giving proper credit to other people. However, most reviewers don't do that. Going out and really looking if everything is credited properly is one of the most time consuming tasks when you review a paper and most reviewers simply aren't going through that trouble. The only downside for most authors is, even though all of this is pretty much in their favor, a lot of them still require that stamp of approval that 
peer review accepted at a good conference. So their incentive is to keep submitting to conferences as many papers as possible, basically count on that random process to get them accepted. And after that, they're just fine. They have the stamp of approval. There's absolutely no requirement to revise it. There's absolutely no requirement to have other people comment further on the work. So I guess the complaining here right now is just about the noisy process and everyone complains that their particular paper, which is at the behest of the noisy process as everyone else's paper, got an unfair treatment in that random process, which half the papers do, probably more. The incentives in the systems are actually even bigger for what I call the big names. Okay, these are the big research institutions of companies or big name professors, anyone that has some sort of reputation. People argue that anonymous reviewing is actually good for small authors, good for unknown authors, because it hides their identity and the big names basically aren't able to play their big name credit to a paper. However, there's an easy way to know that this isn't the case. The big names are doing just fine. Here's the issue. If you want your name to be attached to something, you're gonna find a way to do it. People are suggesting archive blackout periods and whatnot, anonymous submissions to archive. You have to realize that if someone wants to give some information to the public, they are going to. In fact, right now, the big names are finding every possible way to have their names attached to things and massively increase their chances of getting through the anonymous peer review process. You got to realize if you're well connected, not only do you have an advertising platform, but you can also pretty easily find out who your area chairs are, who's reviewing, um, in which track your paper gets and so on. So allow me to be a little bit skeptical about the claim that we need more anonymity in this process. I think we need less. Second, what are the incentives of the conferences itself? So the conference organizers, they want to have a good reputation, which basically means they want to be like a cool nightclub. Lots of people want to get in, but they have to reject a lot of those people in order to make the club exclusive and have a high reputation. So conferences have every reason to invite everyone to submit as much as possible, but then to reject as much as possible to make it seem like it's super hard to get in. This only makes the problem worse. And I think the current explosion isn't really desired by the conferences. As the process is super noisy, they're slowly losing their reputation that way, but still the incentives aren't to lower the amount of submissions and increase the overall quality, because that means a higher percentage of submissions will have to get accepted, which means that the conference appears to be less exclusive. And lastly, let's look at the reviewers themselves. This is the most screwed up part in the system. I have every incentive to be a reviewer for one of these conferences because I can write that on my CV. Hey, I was a reviewer at a big name conference. And then once I am accepted as a reviewer, I have every incentive to do absolutely nothing. In fact, the less time I waste with this, the better, because I'm not getting any public credit. I'm anonymous, right? Anonymous peer review. I'm not getting any reputation out of this and in fact, I can only lose from accepting papers and I can only lose from writing detailed reviews. If I'm short and vague and I reject a paper, not only can I not really be criticized because I'm not saying much, it's actually in my overwhelming interest. If the paper has some sort of big mistake and I overlook it and I accept the paper and the other reviewers see that mistake. This looks really, really bad for me. Even though I'm anonymous in the broader context, it also looks bad for the area chair supervising me. If they don't see it, it looks bad for the conference if their area chairs don't see it. So there's a massive push to not make mistakes. However, if I reject a paper that was actually good, I can just say, well, no, they can resubmit to the next conference. So I already have a giant prior to reject a paper. Add to that, that usually the papers that I review might be my competition. And by the conference incentive of being pretty exclusive, the more of my competition gets accepted, the less I might get accepted. Because not only are there limited amount of space, 
not formally, but informally, other work might overlap substantially with my own and therefore make it less likely that I get published. Also, other work might actually criticize my work. And I don't like that. And this is a bit cynical, but I'm not saying everyone does this, but there is an incentive for you as a reviewer, especially if the work is close to what you're doing, to reject it now, implement the same or a very similar idea, and then submit to the next conference where these other authors also will submit and hope for the random process to just for your paper to get more lucky than their paper. Flat planting on archive counters this a little bit, but I'm afraid that with proposed solutions like more archive blackout periods, more anonymity, these problems will only get worse. Maybe some people don't realize this, but as a reviewer, it's really easy for me to reject a paper. I can almost always find reasons to reject a paper. If it's a theory paper, I can ask for experiments. If it's an experimental paper, I can ask for more experiments. Why didn't you test that data set? Why didn't you compare against this method? Why are your assumptions so strong? They're never guaranteed in practice. Is the problem even relevant? Your theory is too weak. Have you looked at this other special case? And if I really want to, I can just ask many, many, many questions, not even criticisms, just many questions. And I know the authors just have a one page rebuttal. They can never answer all my questions if I do that. And then I can simply argue the authors failed to address all my questions properly. So you might be asking, why do some reviewers actually do a good job? And that is, I believe, really a lot to do with goodwill. Most people are actually well intended. Most people actually want to do a good job in reviewing, have the ethos of science and do take the time to do the reviews, even though they're incentivized to do them badly, even though they're incentivized to reject papers. A lot of people still do a good job. However, reviewer number two usually doesn't. And it only needs a very few reviewer number twos to make the field a whole lot worse. Now there's a question to be said, aren't we all a bit reviewer number two? Have you ever written a review that the authors might think is completely unreasonable? And while there is some truth to that argument, I definitely know that there are differences in reviews. In fact, I've heard people brag about writing two line reviews where the second line is, you didn't cite and compare to my own work and then laugh about that. So goodwill won't carry us all the way if the incentive structure is bad. And I believe most of this is because we've taken out the reputation game out of the review process. In smaller fields of science, it used to be that the journal editors knew the reviewers and their reputation, at least towards the journal editor, was on the line for all of future if they did a bad job. Right now, everything's so big, so anonymous, people hardly remember the names of their co-reviewers. No reputation is being damaged by bad reviews and that's how we get here. So of course, I'm not the first one to observe these problems. So many people have proposed solutions and most of these solutions fall into the basis of what I would call AC based methods, which is basically where someone evaluates the reviews while the reviews remain anonymous. And that someone is usually the area chair. So right now the area chair can already decide that a reviewer is really bad. And then the reviewer will not be invited to review the next time around. I just want to point out the irony of the situation. Conferences nowadays have so little reviewers that they require every author to be a reviewer, but then your punishment for writing bad reviews is that you won't be invited to be a reviewer the next time around. I mean, can you make a better point that the system is failing? Of course, the problem with all AC based methods is that you're basically moving a problem that has everything to do with people being unaccountable, noisy, not experty, having no time and every single incentive to do as little as possible. <laughs> you transfer that problem to even less people that have even less time, that have even more stress, that have an even broader view and topic area <laughs> and are single people instead of three or four people. So it's even more noisy. If anything like this is implemented, you'll just, instead of seeing complaints about bad reviews, in addition, you will also see complaints about bad ACs that will certainly not make the problem any less. In fact, I would argue any AC-based solution will make the problem 
worse. Other solutions are what I call payment based solutions like give the reviewers money to review. I don't see how that fixes the incentive for you to reject anything. You just might write it in a little bit more eloquent style. Also, as soon as you bring money into the game, that automatically excludes a lot of people, depending on how you do it, that aren't as affluent, which is certainly something we don't want as a community. Other people are pointing to things like open review, which I agree is a better system. However, it is still anonymous. So the same incentives exist and it is still a conference where you get a stamp of accept or reject. And once it's accepted, no one cares about the reviews anymore. In fact, in open review, you can write as much text as you want. So the ACs are even more overloaded with lots of text to make their decisions. So something I want to highlight is a thread by Thomas G. Dietrich on Twitter, where he basically suggests some sort of a wiki, some sort of a collaborative research wiki, where you'd have a set of senior authors that basically maintain that wiki, that do a first check of papers and kind of match them against the wiki of what's already known. I won't go through that here, I will link it and I definitely advise you to read it because it's a very interesting proposal. It's a sort of utopian dream. I would actually welcome if we all work together on increasing the knowledge of mankind in a wiki style way. However, I think lots of people want their names attached to things. And even if you do what Thomas suggests and basically have people write papers and then the editors integrate that into the wiki, it is not clear how that system, where the editors clearly need to be senior and experienced, could deal any better with the explosion of research that we're dealing right now. They would be as overloaded as the current system. Plus, who's gonna be an editor? Thomas says becoming an editor would be a very esteemed career path. And again, I completely welcome if that were the case in the future. However, simply decreeing that something would be very esteemed doesn't make it that way. It's not fiat money. So as much as I would like that, I just don't believe it would work. And especially I don't believe it would work right now. And I think it would be subject to the same problems. So can we come up with a better solution? I think yes. But the way to go there is to align what we want as a community with the incentives of people and not go against it. Because as soon as you go against it too much, people will find a way around it. So the first thing I want to suggest is we abolish conference publishing. This weird notion that you submit your paper to this conference and then all at the same time a random process is happening and three random people give their opinion while reading your paper for a couple of minutes and then you get an accept after which your paper is there never to be revised or a reject, which simply means you try again, seems to be preposterous, I'm sorry. So people wonder, yeah, but how do we know when a paper is accepted? Who cares about acceptance? Who cares? Why can't we just switch to citations? Citations is a pretty good measure of how much people care about a paper. And yes, big names will get more citations, but they do so now and they do so more effectively than ever. Why can't we just put our papers on archive and then run some kind of page rank algorithm over the citations such that self citations aren't worth as much. I mean, search engines figured out how to deliver you the most relevant search result to a query 20 years ago. Why can't we simply apply the same techniques to research determining this work is quite relevant this work is not that quite relevant. I get it, citations take time and you won't immediately know after publishing, but I think that's a step we can take. Especially since conference publishing is also lagging like half a year behind publishing on archive, during which pretty much nothing happens. And then people say, oh, but what about peer review? Peer review, peer review does not work. Peer review is a joke in machine learning, okay? No one cares about the reviews. Reviewers are a nuisance. You have to get past them. All the people still pretend to care that it means something that reviewers 
agree or disagree with you. It doesn't. In fact, I want to get to a system where peer review starts at the moment where you publish a paper on something like Archive and then never finishes for the lifetime of that paper. As new knowledge comes in from the field, the paper can be continuously re-examined. And if the paper turns out to be really important, more and more scrutiny can be applied to it. Seems like a much better system than simply throwing the same amount of pretty random reviewers at every paper and then giving it the stamp or not. So here's what I suggest. We keep something like archive, but amend it with a commenting function. And the commenting can be pretty feature rich. So you could incorporate plots and references to other things. This goes very much towards a kind of a collaboratively edited wiki, but where people still put their names on things. So let's say I publish a paper, someone else could publish a comment, which would be not less in quality than a paper. It can be, it can be a two line comment. It can be a full rewrite of the paper. It can be an amendment. So I could have published a paper and someone else could say, look, I've done your code on a different data set and here are the results. People could then cite my paper or they could cite comments and the citations will determine the relevance. The comments would also be right there on archive. So every time someone goes to look at that paper, they'll see the comments along with it. So if the paper has a big mistake, they'll basically see the comment that says, hey, this paper has a mistake and I can prove it right here. And then they can maybe see a response to that saying, no, you're wrong. And people can make up their own minds. We could build in some kind of voting system, like a stack overflow system for ranking comments. But instead of making this stamp of approval thing a one-time event by a random set of people, let everyone make up their own mind and let people discuss. And you can even have anonymous comments on these sites because the comments will be evaluated on what they are writing and not who it is by. Now, of course, if it does turn out that commenting will become cool after a while, you can also comment non-anonymously and maybe get little medals like you get on Stack Overflow. I don't see that happening, but if it does, the better. Now, as a side suggestion, can we please stop publishing stuff in PDFs? It's so, like, why do we still do this this many pages, this margin, and so on. I get it, some people still print out their papers, but websites are so much nicer to look at and can be made to print adequately. Let's start publishing research as HTML, not as PDFs. So remember when I said the authors have a big incentive to not have comments on their paper? This pretty much goes against that, right? So it is entirely conceivable that the authors will just start self-hosting. Big company like Google could simply not publish to archive anymore. They could simply publish to their own website and remove themselves from the ability for other people to comment. Now this can be solved technologically pretty easy by creating something like a browser plugin that if you find a piece of research anywhere, it'll simply fuzzy match the title, find the appropriate comments to that research as a unified set of comments across all of the internet. In contrast, conferences should be conferences. It should be places where people come up meet up and talk about relevant issues that are happening right now. If I go to a conference now, most of the talks on the papers is from research that is six months old or older. Why don't we have conferences that are simply consisting of invited keynotes, panel discussions, and things that are now called workshops where we discuss current, maybe unfinished research, have poster sessions, for many more people, there's no acceptance, there's no declining. If there's not enough room, do a lottery or something like this. But make the conferences a place where science is happening and not where we flash six months old research. So why is this not happening? I already said that most of the incentives are actually towards the current system as much as people complain about it. Now conferences are slowly losing their reputations, as I said, because over time, people will catch on to the fact that the signal being accepted at a particular conference is, is more and more noisy. However, the system is still upheld by most PhD students, for example, needing a certain amount of conference accepted submissions in order to graduate. So what we really need is professors, and I'm calling on every professor out there, to start giving out PhDs 
while absolutely not caring about the number of conference accepted submissions that a student has. And that seems like something that's very doable because it requires individuals, professors, to simply change their practices with which they let people graduate. So that was it for my little rant on conferences and reviewer number two. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Uh, I value your input very much. And I hope we can get to a future where conferences are conferences and research is just done on the basis of its coolness and relevance. All right, I'll see you. Bye-bye.